so I did teach a class, a tip class in 2014 around my current exhibition at the Penn Museum. And I just want to say that it was really rewarding for me personally. Um, and I loved helping the teachers, you know, and I, if I didn't have the answers, I would, I can always help you find them. So I hope that my presentation tonight gives you a little bit of a sense of what um, you might get out of my class. Um, and hopefully it's something relevant, you know, to some of you. Um, so I just have a few slides, maybe 10 slides. Um, and what I want to let you know is that the course is aligned and focused to educate the next generation about Indigenous perspectives and Indigenous histories and issues, not only of the past, but very much of today. Um, and what my hope is, is that I can help you see American history and our relationship with Native American peoples and communities more honestly, perhaps, than um, is done in many of our American history textbooks. Um, and my goal in the class will be to try to help create a better understanding of Native America and specifically Native American values. Um, my other goal will be to have fun in the class and to help you do so um, and to bring this back to your students. Um, so with that said, um, my primary method in the course will be to have you meet and learn from as many living native specialists as possible. And so certainly we will do that through reading about their work um, and looking at their work, but also through a few guest speakers that we actually will invite to our Zoom sessions. Um, and Edward and I are working on that. And you know, without having necessarily to pay people to fly to Philadelphia, it's just terrific. And it has opened the door in so many ways um, because this class will really be focused in New Mexico and Arizona. Um, so that will be really, I think, a fun sort of live element to the classes. Um, here on the screen, I just have a couple of examples of people that you will meet. Roxanne Swensel is a really internationally renowned Pueblo artist from the community of Santa Clara Pueblo in New Mexico. Tani Natani in the center there is a Navajo weaver and sheep herder. She is a fourth generation weaver and is a really this amazing woman who walks the walk on um, sustainability and, and Navajo spirituality, which is amazing. And then also Tony Chevaria is a colleague with whom I am co-curating the exhibition at the Barnes Foundation. So he is a Tewa native person and he is a curator at MAYAC, which is the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So that just gives you a tiny taste of at least three people that I'm hoping to actually bring into the course. Um, okay, so we will begin in the class. I, I am gonna lay it out somewhat chronologically for you in the, in the beginning so that this will help you lay a foundation um, for your own knowledge and sort of a structure um, on which you can hang, you know, these different voices and different um, life biographies of individuals of if we will focus primarily on Navajo communities and Pueblo uh, people. So um, we'll look back um, in the beginning and we will we'll help you understand places like this. M many of you may have been to some of our amazing national parks. This is Mesa Verde and Colorado um, and where ancestral Pueblo people, essentially the ancestors of the living Pueblo people in New Mexico and Arizona today, where they came from in part. Some of them came from this region. Others um, that we will look at, we'll look at Chaco Canyon and many other sites in the beautiful Southwest. And what will we do? I will help you look at the ar architecture um, and think about, you know, how did they live in that incredible environment? Um, and what were the conditions, you know, and, and what are sort of the early foundations of the Southwest arts of ceramics and textiles and jewelry that we will look at throughout the whole class. Um, so in, after that, um, we also will be looking at the history of colonization, which really is probably a theme that some of you teach in social studies or in high school history. 
Um, and it probably, there are many areas I think that you could work on on this subject because we'll look at Spanish colonization, we'll look at the Mexican period, and then we'll also look at American colonization, which is in many ways continuing today. Um, so we'll look at the impacts of the Spanish who came in the middle of the 16th century and the really brutal, just very difficult, difficult history of missionization. Um, and how is it that the Pueblo people survived um, with the Spanish uh, forced labor and um, really um, complex histories? Um, we'll look at the Pueblo revolt specifically of 1680 when the Pueblos actually unified together and threw off the Spanish for a number of years, although they did return um, later. Um, and um, we will also talk about and learn about the interrelationships of Catholicism and how together eventually the Pueblo people did um, manage to, you know, create a, a new kind of existence as they, as they continued on with this under Spanish rule. Um, and we'll look briefly at the Mexican period. And then we'll also look at as well at Pueblo religion and also then the similar issues among the Navajo community as well. Um, so next we will look at American um, history, Mar American settle settlement in the region. Um, and we'll look at places like Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Taos, and learn a bit about what drew um, outsiders to this beautiful region, how it is that they got very interested in Native American spirituality um, as sort of reje a rejection of industrialism, and they found a safe haven, many outsider settlers did, in this region of the Southwest. Um, and they created this, what is actually the myth of Santa Fe. It, it is something that is created. It's not something that was there. So that's a really fascinating story. And out of that, um, really the white settlers are the ones who really pushed this a whole idea of American Indian art. So this story of you know, this overlay of settlement. Yet what I really wanna get in at this, in this class is you know, the, the fundamental Native American values that are held underneath this um, settlement and um, and what those values are and try to draw those out for you because that is really what has sustained Native people through um, these difficult periods. Okay, um, so in that we will I mentioned the Pueblo Revolt, but we also will talk about the history of the Navajo Long Walk and um, their internment at Bosque Redondo between 1863 and 1868. This is not a story that is really told from the Navajo point of view. Um, and then after the um, American government finally realized that this wasn't effectively working, they did let the Navajo people return to what was now a reservation um, restricted lands. And so we'll talk about how Navajo people readjusted and and sort of dealt with this new trade economy and then the development of tourism on top of that. So we'll look at weaving traditions and herding and Navajo lifestyles and how Navajo spiritualism really helped them get through that period. Um, we'll also talk about what's happening today um, in these communities in New Mexico and Arizona. Um, so this is the community of Acoma Pueblo, which is situated high on top of a mesa top just west of Albuquerque. Um, one of the oldest communities in the United States, in fact. So we'll look at current issues and lifestyles and help you see that Native people are very similar to um, non-Native people in many ways. Many have jobs in Albuquerque and towns nearby and commute back to their um, Native communities on a regular basis. Many families have houses in two places and they're sort of moving back and forth in between. Um, so many current issues are just really fascinating and I can't really touch on many of them tonight, but just to give you a sense of that. Um, and so the whole course, will, we will very much be looking at um, sort of through different lenses, looking at material culture 
I don't usually say art because for native people, they don't make art, you know, to be admired. Um, native art is really something that is considered to be alive. Um, it is something to be used and worn on the body. And it is really truly embedded still to this day um, with um, material, in a material sense, um, connections back to the natural world. Um, and it has a, continues today to play very often a, a meaningful and spiritual role um, in practice of native religion and just um, practices of living every day as well. Um, so we'll talk about that and help you understand, um, you know, how is it that these art forms are meaningful for Native people and how has that sustained itself through time? Um, so we'll look at three traditions primarily, pottery, um, uh, clay dug from the earth and still painted often with natural paints um, in traditional ways. Often we also will talk about the, the global economy and how many Pueblo people at the same time and at once, you know, make a living from, from um, selling their work. So, um, and then we'll talk about textiles and the very deep, deep, long history of Pueblo and Navajo textiles in the region, beginning first with Pueblo textiles made of cotton, which is a natural plant. Um, and these have very spirit, spiritual roots. Um, Pueblo garments are still worn um, today in Pueblo dances. If you've had the opportunity to go to such a dance today, these Cotton garments are not usually sold on the market, but they're really, they are sold internally. And actually my dissertation research was about Pueblo textiles and how those were sustained through the mission period um, and how they continue to be meaningful today. On this slide there, I show you a Navajo textile. Um, and this is a slightly different tradition, but Navajo people learn to weave originally from Pueblo people, yet they have their all of their own ideas and connections with the spider deity who has um, taught them how to weave and has helped sustain these weaving traditions through time for the Navajo people. Um, and then on the left there, you see that Navajo necklace, a squash blossom necklace. Um, so this is a really iconic form that has squash blossoms, the flowers of the female um, squash plant. And this is really all about fertilization and this sort of amazing lifestyle, life cycle connected with water and plants. And you know, you're, you will get through studying these different forms, a sense of sort of a holistic perspective, the holism that is um, sort of endemic to a native perspective. Um, and I will hope to help you learn about that so that you in turn can help your students, you know, see the world in a different way through a native perspective. Um, and while these art, these art objects are made individually by artists, um, they actually have a role to play in very deliberate practices that are sustained and continue in these communities today, the Pueblo dance, for example, and we will get into Navajo examples as well. Um, this is a picture of a deer dance, which happens in the wintertime every year in Pueblo communities. Um, okay, I want to just talk a little bit about the books that we'll be looking at. Um, I have some really excellent readings that are very engaging and really very interesting. Um, and just a couple of examples here. Um, Reclaiming Diné History by a wonderful Diné historian at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, Jennifer Nez. Um, and then in the middle there, Where There's No Name for Art, a beautiful, beautiful book written actually by Pueblo children and young people um, with their art teacher, Bruce Hucko. And this is a magnificent book it, just for adults um, alone, but also for kids. So it's a really tremendous um, book that really, that really comes from the heart of the Pueblo communities in a really unusual way. Um, and then the third book there is a brand new book written by um, two fifth generation Navajo weavers, Barbara and Lindra Ornelas. Um, and um, Barbara's work, it will be in the Barnes exhibition. Um, and several of these speakers will also be coming um, and uh, talking 
um, at public events through the Barnes Show as well. Um, okay, I wanted to also, I just have a couple of more slides to let you know that um, my hope is with COVID, um, you know, working its way out, uh, my hope is that we will have at least a couple of sessions in our special study room at the Penn Museum where you can work very close in a hands-on way with um, Native American art objects. And so my hope will be to bring forward pottery, textiles, and jewelry. This is a photograph of a Hopi colleague who I worked with on the last exhibition, teaching the last tip class of teachers right there in the room with, with Patty. Um, so this is just a really special experience. And I think when looking at material objects, it's just very important for you to be able to at least have one, hopefully two class sessions where you can actually handle um, some of these objects and really get a feel for that. And hopefully this will help you and maybe inspire you to think about teaching with your students around material objects in maybe some new ways that we could talk about and help you create. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to show you the website and the dates of our exhibition that will be at the Barnes um, the following semester. So this will be in the spring of 22. So ideally, if you create your new curriculum units in the fall, you will then be able to plan ahead and bring your students to the Barnes exhibition um, in the spring. Um, so that is sort of Edward and my and the Barnes um, and Penn's hope, you know, that this will help the Philadelphia community of teachers in this way and sort of give you a full package um, then to be able to have your students walk around and really see this art and meet some of even more artists um, in this way. Um, finally, I wanted to just talk a little bit about, um, oops, about um, the fact that I think there are many, many thematic possibilities for your curricular projects. You can think about and teach about indigenous values and perspectives, different ways of looking at the world, which is a very holistic, alive system um, where everything is alive, mountains, wind, animals, plants, and people, and where life itself is sacred in every form from the little tiny insects to the wind and you know, your, your family members and community as well. Um, you also could do a project on Native American art and material culture, clay weaving, jewelry, but you also could think about other things. You could do architecture, you could do something on the prehistoric sites, you could do petroglyphs, you could do food, you could do clothing. I think there are lots of things we could explore that I could help you with. Um, you could think about art practices. And for many artists, this work is not just art, it's actually much more than that. It's a very healing, meditative um, kind of thing. And one example, oftentimes people talk about, the weavers talk about how incredibly mathematical the weaving is. And, you know, I, you don't really realize that until you actually get into the making of it. So. Um, that would involve maybe making a loom in your classroom um, or something of that nature, which we've done before. Um, you also could think about different kinds of histories, object histories, oral histories, and biographies, um, and helping students think about how they might create their own histories or their family histories, um, and maybe getting at a more accurate or a truer history of issues around colonization and assimilation as well. So those are just a few examples. Uh, okay, I think that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you so much. I hope I haven't gone on too long and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have.